Buonasera, mentre aspettiamo l'ultimo relatore, comincio una brevissima presentazione. E a nome del festival soprattutto ringrazio eh, Steve Massa e Dave Kerr, in particolare per questa rassegna, ecco Steve, eh, Steve Massa e Dave Kerr, che hanno curato la rassegna dedicata a Leo Maccari, è da dieci anni che facciamo delle rassegne di grandi registi americani nel passaggio dal muto al sonoro e, e Maccari era il prossimo nella lista già quando lavoravamo con Peter già da, da vari anni doveva capitare e siamo molto felici che sia capitato quest'anno e ringrazio anche Jonathan Rosenbaum e Serge Bromberg che eh, prende il posto di Bernard Eisenschitz che era indicato nel programma It's not Bernard as in Chiefs, for sure. <laughs> and so, uh, thank you again, and... A voi la parola. Grazie. Sorry to be late, this came from uh, the Milky Way, and I guess you people walk much more quickly than we do. But if you weren't there, it's shameful. Uh, a great example of a, a McCary film that I've seen countless times in terrible copies, sitting by myself in front of a television set. And when you see it with a full theater and a good print, it becomes something completely different. It's because this man understood audience psychology probably better than any comedy director I can think of. The timings of the, of those, the gags just become impeccable you know, when you have that crowd of 300 people. And when you're sitting by yourself in front of the television, you're going, that's kind of funny, that's kind of funny, that's sort of funny. But with the crowd, people are on the floor. Uh, so it's important to remember that McCary is not a television director. McCary made his movies for big audiences, for big laughs, and in many cases, big tears, big emotions. Uh, a director of genuine scale, I think. Let me add it over to my partner, Dusty Massa. Opening observation. Um, well, as I mentioned yesterday, when we did our introduction to Part Time Wives, the first show, I think of McCary as one of the great humanists of the American cinema because his films all focus on people and their quirks and foibles and how they sort of interact and escalate. Um, Dave and I were talking as we walked down here, we noticed how important animals are in many of his films, with, uh, you know, Asta in The Awful Truth this morning, and last night, the Charlie Chase films was almost a buddy festival. Buddy was a little dog, and he was in three out of the four films. Buddy is related to Asta. Yes, yes, and there was a silent comedian named Gail Henry, who was in his wooden wedding. She's the woman that gets the diamond down her back and then Charlie takes her to dance so it falls through her skirt. She was a very popular comedian. She had her own series in the early 1920s. And she worked quite often with Chase. Buddy was her dog. Um, she and her husband's dog. And because of Buddy's popularity, popularity, they got started providing dogs for movies. And their big star was a dog named Skippy who became Asta in the Thin Man series and is a dog in all the truth. So again, Gail Hennon worked a lot with the Carrie approach and then continued to work through her dog with him later. Maybe even another microphone with all of us. that one here. Right. Uh, Jonathan Rosenbaum would like to offer some introductory observations? Well, I think uh, I, I have a similar experience to yours with Milky Way uh, in the sense that I don't make, you know, seen it digitally before. And uh, one of the things that struck me as really remarkable is what he could do with, well, other actors. I mean, uh, I don't know if, I mean, uh, I've never seen Adolf Bonjou give a performance like he does in Milky Way, for example. And, uh, and what he does with Lionel Stander also. And I kept thinking while I was watching it too that it was, that other directors really learned a lot from McCary. It seems to me unless I'm missing some references, that uh, Preston Sturgis and Mad Wednesday learned from this movie, even in putting uh, How Am I to Get Over the Lion. Well, there's Master Steel. Oh, yes. The remake, it was a lot of suit, a lot of personality, the girlfriend of Jack 
Oh, yes. So I'm, I'm not up in my uh, Harold Lloyd uh, references as much. But I think that um, it seems to me that even the use of secondary actors is something that Preston Sturgis also could have learned a lot with from, as with Lionel Sanders. And of course, even someone like Ozu learned from McCary, I think, um, quite directly when it's. Sorry. Yeah, the source of that quote has never been uh, correct. Well, it does seem to me that the physicality of, I mean, that there is a kinship, whether there was an influence or not. Of course, one thing we have to bear in mind also that's very important is Jean Renoir said of McCary that no one understands people better than in Hollywood more than Leo McCary. And I think that to understand the full breadth of that, I think we, we have to realize that there's a kind of, um, well, Dave referred to Fort of Laughter and Tears. Uh, actually, one of the most beautiful texts about McCary that I've read was back in the 60s in a dictionary to cinema by Bernard Eisenschitz, who I'm sorry is not here, who basically not only talked about tears and laughter being very close to one another in McCary's films, but even points out that in the sort of convulsive final moments of Good Sam, which is concluding this series, you can't really tell whether Anne Sheridan is laughing or crying. It's part of the power of that sequence. And um, there's also an important line I recall that Bernard recalled in, from uh, an affair to remember when uh, Deborah Kerr is crying and she says that that's what beauty does to me. Um, I think that there's a very, one thing that makes McCary special in both comedy and tears, is that not in every film by any means, but I think in his most personal and committed films, he's a very disturbing filmmaker. I think that there are elements in Good Sam, of course, in um, certainly in Make Way for Tomorrow, also in A Fair to Remember, where he you could you could almost say he goes over the top. He does he goes beyond what we normally uh, find acceptable. And in fact, in the case of Good Sam, which I think, like a good day, is a really neglected masterpiece, a really great film, um, he even come, almost resembles somebody like Howard Hawks in making Red Line 7000, and that it becomes so personal and there's such an investment in what he's showing that it goes against his commercial instincts. That, I mean, when I've seen, saw the long version, thanks to Dave, of Good Sam, you know, before this. It's it's a greater film in its long version, but you also have to sit through every stanza of a little girl reciting the night before Christmas for no particular reason at that point in the film. It's, um, I think, and of course that that's partly because you could almost say it's even almost like a kind of experimental director because he's interested in finding whatever means he can to address what he's concerned about. And I think in, in Good Sound, it becomes a very upsetting but honest self-portrait and self-interrogation, even more than self-portrait, that he's almost like testing himself and trying to test his theme against all sorts of um, different things. And even at the expense of creating a coherent universe, because this is a universe in Good Sound where everybody, at, at, different moments, everybody is horrible and or everybody is wonderful. It's There's a kind of uh, instability to the whole world that he's showing, precisely because I think he can't get low of the theme of what happens to someone who keeps um, trying to live up to Christian precepts and making hell for everyone in his family and the world around him sometimes because of it. And it's also important in Good Sam, for example, that he's as invested in the life as he is in Good Sam himself, that her skepticism is something that we feel just as much as we feel his goodness. And even though it's called a self-portrait, it seems to me it's an autocritique, uh, and a very ferocious autocritique at the same time. You alluded to the uh, episodic nature of McCary's structure when you mentioned the uh, Removable scene, yeah, right before Christmas, which I imagine is something that comes from his experience 
making short comedies. And perhaps uh, Serge Bromberg, who has very generously provided us with uh, copies of very many things for short comedies. Well, thank you, Dave. Yeah, um, at Lobster, we're collecting uh, all kinds of films, but mostly rare films, and of course, the older, the rarest, and the silent Charlie Chase and Lauren Hardy comedy are uh, rare, or at least they were rare, uh, and they seem to be all around now. Uh, the Leo McCary for me is the man who actually managed the Hal Roach uh, studios at the period where there were a few famous uh, stars, Charlie Chase and Lauren Harvey, among many others. Steve could give you the endless list of them, he's the best at it. He could give you the story, I mean, the, the, the curriculum of every single dog you would see in any uh, slapstick comedy. He's a whiz at this. Uh, but Leo McCary gave the Hal Roach film their unique uh, uh, sensibility until 1929 when they became sound and when he left. So uh, we owe him a certain pace, a certain way of uh, uh, directing the actor, but he was a bit much more than that, even for the films that he did not direct. Uh, he was uh, supervising everything. So is it Fred Gayle or uh, Clyde Brockman or so many others? Films are supervised, imagined, written, uh, scripted, and reviewed, and reviewed until they are perfectly okay for release by McCarry and his crew. You can clearly see yesterday for Parker and White, for example, that he's, he, when he goes to sound films, he still has the uh, routines and the pacing of, uh, of those slapstick comedies. For me, McCarry is a very strange, uh, uh, director because he started with these purely magical uh, comic moments in the silent era and ended with pure uh, uh, emotional uh, perfection like an affair to remember. It's about the same way that with Billy Wilder and Avanti, you know, those films where at the end of their lives a director tries to think of what he has done good and what remains of his creation. Well, for me, what remains of his creation, of course, is duck soup. The rest is around duck soup. And, uh, and, and basically, what makes the Charlie Chase and Laurel Harvey and Harold film so special is that there is a sensibility. There is humor that is basically a human being who has written those ideas that what, what is so strange in my own life that I could put on screen in this very bizarre way called the slapstick comedies? The Hal Roach, the Leo McCary supervised slapstick comedies are brilliant because they are not only comedy. They are uh, made by a man, by men who love to work together and this, em this emotional uh, uh, gathering to do those films, even if it's jokes for kids, that's what some people would regard them, are actually amazing achievements in mixing comedy and tragedy, and that's what life is all about. So that's what my, Leo McCary is for me. It's the man from Makeway for Tomorrow and for Duck Soup. He's a man for sweet and sour, and there's not so many of this size. Um, one thing I think is worth adding is that very few directors seem to be combined silent aesthetics with sound aesthetics as successfully as uh, McCary does, and as exemplified by the, by actually the Milky Way, also by Duck Soup, um, Rebels or Red Gap. I mean, it seems to me that they're, they're not simply silent films with the sound, but they're really sound films, and yet they everything that he's learned as a silent director is part of it. Well, I think he's a very important director as far as the transition from silent comedy to sound comedy because when he was supervisor, and, and Serge touched on this, when he was supervisor at the Roach Lot, he slowed down the tempo of the comedies and he talked about it to Peter Bogdanovich in that late interview that he specifically thought that silent comedies were too rapid or too fast paced. So he slowed down the pace. When you see Laurel and Hardy, they're much slower, and of course they're a duo, so they can play off each other even with gestures and, 
and you know expressions back and forth to each other. But the Roach lot, at that time, they slowed down. It's nothing like the fast-paced Max Sennett comedies. It's slowed down, it's more about people interacting. And then, of course, when sound came in, it was a slower tempo than silent films. So he was ideal, he was already doing that, which is very apparent in part-time life. You know, that kind of interplay where they're chasing each other around the living room. So I think it's very important in, in making comedy more, I don't know, realistic or naturalistic in the, in the early sound. Yeah, I would say the difference between Keystone and Roach is that Keystone gags kind of substitute for character, and then Roach uh, gags our character. It's all foil. Right. Um, one of the more interesting things about the carry to me is you know, the sense of uh, uh, embracing both extremes that Jonathan mentioned. He's not afraid of paradox. He's not afraid of unresolvable issues. All of those contradictions are expressed, and he is not afraid of uh, an open ending, which is uh, also very rare in this kind of form. And uh, I suppose I would add to that that uh, he is one of the comedy directors whose world begins with a couple rather than an individual comedian. Very hard to imagine McCary successfully directing Keaton, you know, someone who lives effectively in his own world by himself. Uh, McCary is a very social vision, and I would say almost beyond that, it begins with a couple. There's always a powerful sense of a community around that couple, around that couple as a society, around that couple as a country, and within that globe is a religious dimension. Uh, there is always a powerful religious uh, sense in the films, even when there's no overt reference to it. And as it seems uh, now his, uh, his sense of the world extends into the animal kingdom uh, more profoundly than I have realized. Uh, a great unifier, a, a man who could see globally, who was not blinded by uh, uh, prejudice and, and, and precondition. Yes, I was thinking just when you were saying this, of one, one uh, exquisite moment, and, and I'm going to remember, which is when uh, Cary Grant, who's very embarrassed to be in a chapel, is, um, you know, just sitting next to uh, Deborah Carlos praying, and he's sort of fiddling with his tie because he doesn't quite know if he, you know, like it belongs there. And it's, it's, a, it's a perfect example of Cary being very serious and comic at the same time. Um, it's a religious sequence, and yet it's also very sensitive to someone who's not religious reacting within, within that world. And I suppose the other defining characteristic of McCary is his utter disdain of written screenplays. <laughs> uh, while I was researching the series, I found an early draft of the Good Sam script in the collection of the Museum of Modern Art that had a memo from a junior member of the publicity department to the head of the publicity department. Uh, saying, I'm sorry, I couldn't find you a script for the new McCary film, uh, but as we know, uh, the script of the McCary film seldom bears any relationship to the actual film, so the only real script is the transcription of the dialogue that's made at the end of the movie. Uh, and indeed, the script for Good Sam is radically different from the film that we know, it has a completely different ending, a far more depressing ending. Uh, he ends up an alcoholic, which was also Leo's disease, uh, and is rescued from a mission by Anne Sheridan. And I'm sure the preview audiences were not at all happy by the, this development. So we have a completely ambiguous ending that exists now. Uh, but the man's ability to uh, just gather people around, create a situation, he always had a piano on the set. We have dozens of photographs of him just sitting around with the cast on the set, playing the piano, noodling, people clearly just bouncing lines off each other to see what would happen. Uh, there's a quote from Ralph Bellamy saying he thought the awful truth was the biggest mess he had ever appeared in and just couldn't believe what an amazingly 
well-crafted, well-tuned film it was when he finally saw it. That's the film where Cary Grant pulled it out. Yeah, Cary Grant offered Harry Cohn $5,000 to get out of the contract after a few days. And McCary said, I'll make it 10. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, that is one of the films in which Cary Grant finds Cary Grant and becomes the icon. What, no. What's very funny is, is that in a way, the McCary's methodology is close to what people thought Cassavetti's <laughs> mythology was, but in fact wasn't, because he kept, he put, sort of stuck to his scripts much more than somebody like McCary. I think also there's a certain kind of creativity in relationship to stock situations, because I was thinking it during the Milky Way today, how inventive he is around drunkenness, you know, that first scene with, um, with Lionel Stander, compared with, say, someone who we all love, Raoul Walsh. Raoul Walsh is not, loves to have scenes with drunks, but they're not as inventive as McCary's, I think. Or if you think of the scenes in Good Sam also, um, uh, maybe in the that, bar. Maybe that came from the, a lot of stage routines in vaudeville that he had known when he was young, I and mean, he's famous as Chaplin made his reputation as the inebriate, so uh, this is probably one of the easiest and cheapest thing you can do on the stage that will get the laughters of the time. And obviously when McCary was young, that's the kind of shows that he would attend to uh, at the vaudeville. So this is, McCary is one of those few directors who went to the vaudeville, got ideas, and that DNA of vaudeville, although he, never, he was too young to be in vaudeville, uh, that DNA ended up finding his way in the Roach comedies and actually throughout every single film, even emotional, as emotional as they could become, you have those little glimpses of, hey, okay, remember, this is uh, a, a McCary behind the camera. There's not a McCary film without one of those two signs saying, that's where I belong. I mean, I think he kept the DNA that he had learned at the Howl Road studio with him for the rest of his career. The improvisational, the noodling on the piano, they used to sing. Charlie Chase had a beautiful voice. So there's stories that between takes they do like barbershop quartets. So it was very relaxed. I mean, that's the way silent comedies were made. And I think also what David talked about earlier about using the character people, that started at Roach as well, because you had people like Jimmy Finlayson, Speck O'Donnell, you had these wonderful character players, and he uses them, you know, really well. Max Davidson, people like that at Roach. So that just continued, you know, for the rest of his career. He'd be using Zazu Pitts or Barry Fitzgerald, you know, the sort of, he'd use the cream of Hollywood character people. So that's, you know, so much of, I think, what he continued the rest of his career came from his days at Roach. And some of the best criticism I've read on McCary was written by Jacques Lorcel, a, a great and unfortunately very underrated French critic who desperately deserves a, an English translation. Uh, and he called McCary the cruelest director he knew, far more cruel than Woodwell, because McCary would lead you right up to the separation of the old couple in Make Way for Tomorrow, as we saw in one of the Shorts yesterday, I'm sorry, part-time wife, we have a dog who is all but euthanized. Uh, he walks you right up to the edge of real pain, real suffering. And uh, really, just at the very last minute, we'll sort away, but the sting somehow is, is still there. Questions from the audience? I mean, we, can, we can address... Yeah, um, I'm interested, Serge mentioned sort of Duck Soup being really, and obviously it's one of the best known films, but it was a Marx Brothers movie, so what specifically did McCary bring to that film? Well, there's a, what? Jonathan wants to ask, well, I'll answer it shortly, but as far as I understand, McCary had hardly any control on the film, wanted to not to do it, and he had to do it. Uh, well, eventually, it is the best Marx Brothers film. 
So is it by pure chance or is it just because there was a director who could organize something in this chaos that I have no clue. But for me, the first time I read the name Leo McCary was on a poster when I was seven and I went to see the uh, Soup in a theater. And actually in my living room, you have the double bill poster French of Duck Soup where it was released in 1937. And I mean, if I had to go on a desert island, that's what I would take. No, I think one thing that's significant about Duck Soup in comparison with the other Marx Brothers films is that there aren't the boring interludes that you have to sit through to, uh, that's one thing that's different. There's also, it seems to me, nothing that's quite comparable to that scene with everybody dressed up as Groucho, which, um... Well, Steve can address that, because that's a quote from a Charlie Chase film. Yes. Oh, well, yeah, you're speaking about the mirror routine. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I mean, you can see in the other Mars Brothers films, there really aren't the kind of visual sequences. Um, McCary uses Harpo in these wonderful, uh, more visual sense. I mean, so much of the other films are Groucho and the dialogue and the nonsense dialogue and things. But as, as Jonathan was saying, that the scene with the mirror, and it involves all three brothers at that, like, of course, not uh, Zeppo. But, uh, you know, I mean, gets them all physically involved. And, you know, McCary had done it with Charlie Chase, with, with a short we're going to be showing, I think it's tomorrow, Sitting Pretty, where Charlie and his brother James Parrott do the routine. And, of course, and if you see it, it's almost a complete blueprint for what they did with Harpo and Groucho later. Another thing that I think is distinctive about it is that it almost like holds together thematically more for considering how anarchistic the Marx Brothers are, it seems to me that making a film about them, you know, going to war and, and loyalty and all of these things um, make it a more consistent target than you usually get, where sometimes the target, I mean, all right, Man of the Opera, it's about high art or something. And, but at the same time, it seems to me that it has a more even political meaning in Duck Soup than it does in the other films, because it's really making, it's really saying that there's nothing about the glory of war that deserves our respect. And uh, there are not many other films that say that, actually. Well, there's, um, just, I've, I've been thinking a bit about your question more, and, uh, you know, it, there's not so many sound films that retain the pulse of a silent one. There's not so many long films that retain the energy of a two-reader. Duck Soup seems to be the only film where it slows down, it, it speeds up, but overall you have the feeling that you're watching one of those wacky Harold comedy with of course the Marx Brothers style, with the, the, the dialogue and the, the, the absurdity. But there's some part of Snuff Pollard's It's a Gift in that sidecar that leaves and the motto stays and so on. My feeling is that only a man who had been so much involved for about six or seven years uh, in these two readings could retain that pace and control it. When you watch the scene with Edgar Kennedy where he's selling popcorns and, and it is exactly the pacing of one of those challenge. It, exactly the same. They do the hat routine and, and, and you watch that there's hardly any dialogue but there's no music either. You're watching it and you're just hilarious. It's just hilarious. So that, that's a very much a Leo McCary film in that sense. Uh, my feeling is that it's not just uh, Sam Wood or uh, Norman MacLeod uh, filming the Marx Brothers in action. He's the man who's actually directing the film. Yes, uh, Jonathan, because we did the sound film a long time ago. What about the soundtrack on the Milky Way? Because it's, it's a film where there's practically no music. It's just the music is in the uh, when things happen. But uh, you know, it's that's what I was amazed at. <laughs> the beginning of the film is like there's only well, the dialogue is 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 almost directed musically. I mean, that's one of the things that's so perfectly paced and the way he uses textures like, like I mean, of course, a lot of directors have used uh, 
uh, Lionel Sanders' voice to great benefit, but it's, it seems to me it's rarely been used with the kind of expertise that it's used here. Um, and there are sound effects that are, as punctuation, I'm trying to think of a specific examples. It was something that was occurring to me while I was watching it. That it's a very, that it tends to be a very, like the best, you know, early talkies, very selective kind of soundtrack. You don't get overburdened with things. It's very much, uh, you know, and in fact, that's what's almost better about the early sound talkies than in the later sound films. That they isolate, they have to pick up. Either. Yes. The, the whole sequence was built around the pickup. Oh, the horse, the Winnie. Yeah, as we learned from Suzanne Lloyd, that was Leo McCary providing the Winnie of the horse in the Milky Way, which is news to me here. <laughs> Somehow makes a lot of sense. It's, it's, it's some sign of his versatility that he, that he, that he, that he but used his voice both to imitate it a horse and Robert Walker's dying words in my son chat, actually. Um, and he was never an actor. Never seen to have any actors in performing himself. So. Unlike Renoir, for example. What's well, interesting, though, because um, supposedly he had uh, signature gestures that he used all the time. People who worked at Roach talk about this, that kind of he would sort of go like this. It's a lot of the hand gestures they say that you see in the Roach stuff came from the Carey. The Stan Laurel borrowed some, some of his hand gestures. And Cary Grant does some of them in The Awful Truth. And Cary Grant is almost a doppelganger from the Carey because they look so much alike, um, the suntan. But I mean, even the dark hair and the dark eyebrows. But supposedly, like, the actors would often imitate him, his, his physicalities. Uh, I have a question. Uh, Jonathan mentioned my son John a moment ago, and I know you haven't selected it for the season, and I wondered if you didn't select it for a reason. And if you can, uh, the it. reason is that Guy uh, asked us not to. It was shown two years ago. Okay. So, are you able to comment on that, my son John? Able to say uh, just to talk about it. I mean, uh, uh, the whole blacklist thing. Do you want to get into that at all? Well, I don't know if it's really related so much to the blacklist as it is to the paranoia, which of course in itself is related to the blacklist. I actually think, despite of its incoherences and its craziness, it's one of McCary's greatest films. Partly because it's a film that actually allows us to occupy and sympathize with all of its characters, not just its, uh, you know, mixed up here, you know, title character but with both of the parents who were seen as both foolish and as uh, sympathetic, even with the FBI man, who's a, maybe the most dubious character to be sympathetic with. Um, and it's really about generational struggle in a certain kind of way, about the conflict, about children going apart from their parents. And it's very sensitive to that in a lot of ways. It's, of course, to really do a proper study of it, which no one yet has done, we really have to know better than we do what the original design for the film was before Robert Walker died. We, know, we just know a few things about it, but we don't know enough, I think, to really be able to make the kind of educated guess. I mean, McCary said that if he'd been able to complete it the way he wanted to, it would have been his greatest film, he thought, in one of his interviews, at least. I think it's such a question of him being an anti-communist and a very, very devout Catholic. And to him, communism was a, literally a direct threat to his most cherished beliefs. Politically sophisticated, not terribly. Uh, one of the rare films we're showing here is a half-hour film he made for a Catholic charity called The Christophers in 52, which is kind of his response to uh, social injustice from a religious point of view. Um, Effectively, it's love thy neighbor, uh, pass it along. Uh, he believed that uh, you know all of the principles of egalitarianism implied in uh, uh, communism, and certainly never realized, were, were already contained in Catholicism. And that's expressed very powerfully in this strange little film. Uh, I forget what film 
much showing this now, but it's certainly something to be seen, and you won't be seeing that anywhere else in the near future. Um, yeah, I mean, I've read his testimony at the House on American Activities Committee. It's as dignified as you could have possibly been under those circumstances. He says uh, communism is a terrible thing. He's certainly uh, dead set against it. But communism is, uh, being a communist is not against the law in the United States of America. And he is not about to uh, publicly denounce anyone uh, who is not breaking the law. And certainly worked closely with a lot of communists, as we saw with uh, Lionel Sander, Donald Lockheed Stewart. I think he was able to appreciate those people for uh, what they were. Uh, ultimately, he uh, could not stand the idea of John Howard Lawson taking over the world, so he drew the line in the sand. Uh, but I don't think he's the rather crazy any communist of the popular caricature. Parlo in italiano, con un italiano. Volevo ricordare un po' l'intervento del signor Massa sul concetto di umanizzazione e umanismo di questo regista. Mi riferisco all'orribile verità, dove se non vi fosse stato questo registro così lieve ed una compostezza ritmica incredibile, i contenuti e pensosi che il film ci consegna non sarebbero passati. Pensiamo solo all'ultimo dialogo tra Kerry Grant e l'attrice no? Renan Dunn. Quel gioco di parole su essere simili ma essere cambiati che c'è alla fine del film, quasi come un gioco di parole, ed è potentissimo proprio perché il registro lieve ci consente di riflettere sul fatto della di saper apprendere anche un cambiamento, sapere anche insomma in certo qual modo riflettere eh, sulle cose. Se l'avesse detto in una maniera diciamo così più logica non ci sarebbe rimasto invece quella forza, quella potenza di quel passaggio. E l'altra cosa era proprio gli, anim gli animaletti che eh, cioè hanno una forza espressiva umanizzata anche loro e il passaggio del, che sembrava la morte del cagnolino, che in realtà non è morto, ma la forza dell'amore supera la morte, per me è quasi metafisico quel passaggio lì, ecco io non l'ho visto crudele, anche se è stato crudele quell'attimo di esperienza, eh, ma proprio metafisico, cioè veramente c'è un superamento altissimo eh, attraverso l'animale, ecco, di, di qualcosa di cristico, ecco, non devo dire la verità. It was a comment about uh, about the film The Horrible Truth uh, and about the cruelty of death of a dog. I, I'm so sorry, but I don't know <laughs> the content of the film. So uh, I I think maybe I I understand some of what the lady was saying. She talks about the remark about the humanity of Leo McCary, and um, in particular about the fact that the subject matter of the awful truth handled differently could be uh, so dark, uh, so unhappy, but uh, that he addresses uh, relationships between people in the like manner he does so that you see certain things in a humorful way that uh, is more acceptable. Uh, in particular, she talks about the scene at the end where they're talking about change and that if it were more um, logically discussed, it would be amusing, but it also we wouldn't hear it or understand it so well. Uh, and, and also that the animals, uh, everything, uh, it makes it more uh, acceptable and, and understandable to us, a, a, a subject that isn't so easy to discuss necessarily. I don't know if I did a really good job. Thank you, Mother. If I understood you well, you, you thought that the, the power of love bringing the dog back to life, uh, which I think is a very strong theme in the character, not always expressed as directly as it is in that case. But a lot of the marriage comedies are based on 
there's an initial sexual attraction, these people get married, and then they have to become truly married. Uh, there's a divorce, there's a separation, and they have experiences while they are apart that develop them as human beings. And when they're reunited, they are changed profoundly. And, you know, I think he's as great a religious artist as Brisson. I mean, he has that sense of Catholic redemption incredibly strong. I mean, I am not a believer, but in the course of the Carey film, I am. Uh, love Affair, I think, is particularly profound that way. Um, it's you know, the closest place there is to heaven on earth is the top of the Empire State Building, and that's where they have to end uh, remarry, rediscovered, and, and a truly sanctified relationship. So, for a screwball comedy, that's some pretty heavy stuff, and it's expressed, I think, very beautifully. And you have to remember it's the same year as Make Way for Tomorrow, in which the exact same theme is run through, and the ending is miserably unhappy. They're separated. It is one of the most tragic films I have ever seen. I'm sorry if I just spoiled the film for you, but it is a... Now, Orson Welles once said it's a film that would make a stone cry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it certainly makes me cry. That's, um, I found it really interesting when you mentioned um, a French critic who described McCary as a cool director. However, um, Robin Wood, who uh, was one of the, um, you know, the, uh, the uh, one of the few critics who can um, really capture the essence of McCary, um, he said that McCary is one of the most generous directors, you know, amongst Hollywood and, um, you know, birth in, in the world, and. This makes me think of um, the way uh, uh, Macari edits his film. Because when we think about Macari, it's about um, um, two actors in a two shot reacting to each other. However, um, the more I watch it, uh, particularly like uh, the Ditto Bomb sequence in What Goes Off Red Jet, um, there's some really nice handling of the editing. So I'm wondering how would you comment on um, um, the editing with them? Um, of Leo McCary's film, like the the, spontane, um, the spontaneity of um, those actors' reactions or the interactions between the actors. Okay, is it edited or is it I'm, from um, the actors? I'm not at all sure that there, all this is based on spontaneity. Uh, I mean, when you see Charlie Chase and when you see Part-Time Wife. Uh, the actor is not Charlie Chase, but is behaving exactly like Charlie Chase. It's edited exactly like a Charlie Chase film. So obviously that means that the director is in complete control, and if Charlie Chase continued being Charlie Chase, and some people will say, oh, it was the sound era, so the edit was different and the acting was different. Yeah, but the director was different also. And so my guess is that McCary had this in his um, way of, of conducting the actors. Now, if you ask about the edit, you know, being a musician, uh, by the way, I will play at 6.30 at the Jolie and be there because the three films are amazing, uh, including the funniest comedy ever called Pass the Gravy. Uh, yes. So, the, 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 what comes to my mind is syncopation. Uh, in, that's the word. Uh, in the Maxenet comedies, you would have chase, chase, pop, 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 and it would be like a rhythm, the, the pace that would be regular. Uh, what's so funny about uh, McCary, and Tashlin described that in his speech about slow burn, that's what it is. You have an action that's going somewhere, and all of a sudden they stop, and they watch you, and, and the edit slows down also. It's really like your music, you know, you have one man uh, composing the score, Leo McCary, uh, uh, probably conducting the orchestra, but you also have musicians, and the musicians are, could be all the actors in these films, and they play together. It's obvious that when McCary asks a, an actor to slow down, to slow, to stop, to act, and, and to re resume action, he has in mind the edit that he will do, and that will be unlike the others. Well, even when you watch Duck Soup, I mean, of course there was chaos on the set, but there's no chaos in the editing room. 
And the way the film is structured, you have scenes like the, the war scene in the end when the edit is completely crazy with the fish going up, the, the baboons, and I don't remember, there's so many things. It's, it's Max Sennett wacky style. But then in the middle, you have those scenes with the mirror. The mirror, they could be back and forth, and, but no, it's one of the longest shots in the entire film, and that's what makes it hilarious. And when, in, when uh, Max Linder made that mirror routine in um, uh, Seven Year Bad Luck uh, in 1921, I think, uh, he has intercuts on uh, people watching and so on, which makes it not so funny after all. So, McCarry decides that this will be it. He's the editor, he's the one scoring the film. And it could be the Marx Brothers, it could be anyone else, but it is the old McCarry narration. I, th I think something else could be said about, in the later films of McCarry, and something about the tempo overall, which is, or not just tempo, but that they have a tendency of stopping and starting. Um, that they, it's almost as if they're several films combined together in certain ways. And I think that that's a kind of very special. That's one reason why they tend to be long, also. Um, it's, uh, you get some of that quality, I guess, in Hawks, also. That it's almost like that there are parts of the films that are detachable from other parts. And uh, it's, it's very interesting, because I think it's, uh, it's quite unlike um, directors who feel like you have to keep going at a particular tempo no matter what. This is a film that just starts, stops, and then starts up again. I mean, and, and that you find in, I think, most of the later films. Uh, 
And so it does. I don't know, much like Marlon Hardy, I find he makes a very smooth transition, almost like there's no stumble. He just goes straight into it as if nothing had happened. Because these are not montage pieces. These are acting pieces. You know, these are ensemble pieces. Uh, always character-based. So I, I guess I have to disagree with your comment, but I... I yeah, I mean, the, the technology changes, he becomes more facile into the 30s. Uh, but I don't find his fundamental technique altering all that much. I think we have one time for, time for one more question. We have to wrap it up. If there's anyone? Okay, I guess that'll do it. See you at 6.30. <laughs> Thanks very much. <laughs>